Hello everyone, good morning, and welcome to CTL's Education Professional Development Series. My name is Amy Alcalisi, EdTech Project Manager here at CTL, and I'm joined by Stephanie Gray, Marketing Manager. For those of you who are not familiar with CTL, we are headquartered in Portland, Oregon, and have been providing innovative IT solutions to education and government customers for over 26 years. We are a Google for Education partner, and some of our most popular products include our brands of ruggedized CTO and to-go PC laptops, convertibles, two-in-ones, and tablets designed specifically for K-12 education. Over the last two and a half years, we've worked with Google to introduce a line of CTL Chromebooks that have been recommended by PC Magazine as the best choice for Chromebooks in education. As part of our commitment to education, CTL is offering monthly professional development webinars for our education customers. These webinars will include a variety of topics relevant to K-12 EdTech, but will have a big focus on Google Apps for Education and Chromebooks in the classroom. Today's webinar is an introduction to NoteFlight, presented by John Millenzak, Director of Education, Educational Technology at NoteFlight. However, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop up there in the right-hand corner. You are listening and using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select the telephone button in the audio pane and in the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the question pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. We, yeah. Uh, if we do run out of time, you will be contacted by your sales representative to make sure all your questions are answered. So before we begin, I'd like to take a quick poll to learn a little bit more about you guys. Um, so please indicate if you've ever used NoteFlight. And I'll take a moment to launch this poll for you guys to see. Give you about a minute or so. So there's no experience, some experience, a lot of experience, or I'm an expert. Hopefully everybody can see that, because I'm not getting any votes. I'll keep it about a few more seconds. <clears throat> All right. Well, I'm going to close it. doesn't look like anyone voted, so we have some shy folks today, but that's okay. No worries. We will move on. All right. But before I turn it over to John for our presentation, I would just like to remind everyone about some resources for Nevada 21 educators. When you visit the nr21.ctl .net website, you can learn about upcoming professional learning opportunities. Sign up for updates about upcoming events and information, and please join our Google Plus private community for Nevada 21 educators. I would now like to introduce John Millenzak, the Director of Educational Technology at NoteFlight. John has an extensive range of experiences in music education. He served as the Director of Education for PreSonus Audio and has taught music, music technology, and music business at the elementary, secondary, and collegiate levels. So at this point, I am going to transfer over to his screen. I'm going to change presenters. And I will be back for question and answers. Great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you so much for CTL for having me on today. 
to present uh, this webinar about NoteFlight. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, dive right in. You should all be seeing my um, Google Chrome screen right now. Um, so NoteFlight is an online music notation product. So it's based in any browser. That means it works on any device, whether it's computers, Chromebooks, iPads, anything like that. So it's really um, ideal for uh, the Chromebook adoption with CTL in this particular instance. Um, the great thing is, is that students or teachers can log in from any computer later, so they'll have the ability to have um, their music notation follow them anywhere else and be able to share their scores and their notation with others. So to begin, I wanted to briefly show um, how NoteFlight works as a notation editor. We tried to make it uh, as easy as possible, so we're going to go ahead and start by creating a new score here. Now, the way the NoteFlight editor works, there's lots of different shortcut keys, and we can create a quick make that a half note, and we've created music. We can, of course, quickly slur, edit however we want, add some dynamics, simply type them in, hit enter, and there we go. So there's our example note flight score. Now, um, it's always really great to learn the shortcut keys when, when using this type of product, but everything is available in the palettes above. So on this editor, um, all the different mint palettes are actually on a drop down on the left or right at the top of your screen um, and they're totally customizable. So you can go through and find your basic score uh, functionality saving um, particular score formatting settings here. And then once you get into the editor portion, you have note duration. All of this is available. I can click this and I can pin my note duration right on top and it expands in and out to give the most common features to least common features. But I can pin any of these palettes above as I go through. So of course having to do anything with rhythm, pitch of notes, obviously anything to do with the pitch, sharp flat, up an octave, down an octave, transposition, again I can pin my pitch palette up here, tempo, any text or lyrics. So all of this is laid out in a very um, logical way based on lots of feedback from composers and users. Um, so again, it's very easy to just add and customize what you want as a user or what students may want to see in their particular view. A lot of students like to do colored notes, so we can put the color view and just take it right away. So I can um, keep this open on the left and hover to find any areas, or I can just let it go and pin these up. If I don't want to see a particular palette anymore, I just click it and it goes away. And I can get it right back here if I'd like to. So um, the editor is completely customizable, and as you go through, you'll notice that in any case there is a shortcut key, as I hover, the shortcut key is to the right. So you'll notice sharp is the plus sign, flat is minus, natural is equal. So uh, I always encourage students to go through and as they, as they click things, hover over certain areas, and then eventually they, they'll find themselves learning the various shortcut keys. The same for the palettes on the left. Anytime there's a shortcut key, it's identified next to that particular feature. So um, as far as editor, really easy to use, totally customizable in that way. The other thing I like to mention is the user guide is completely in line with uh, the editor in the exact order that we show it. So at any time someone needs help, they can simply open the user guide from the side panel and you'll notice that the palettes on the user guide are represented in the same order as they are in NoteFlight. So you'll see the same exact order. If you're looking for a particular feature, you can always search on the page um, and find what you're looking for right in the user guide. And it gives specific instructions on how to do that. So I encourage everyone to, to play with the editor and know that the user guide covers everything else and feel free to customize and teach students to customize their particular note flight score. Now, a couple other interesting features. Um, you do have to save. Note flight does auto-save everything locally, so if anything happens, the internet goes out, computer battery dies all of a sudden, whatever happens, it really um, 
automatically will be saved on that machine. But you need to make sure you click save in order for the score to save a version. There is a version history of all scores, which is really helpful. So every revision you can always go back to, especially with students. This is super um, good. Now, for instruments, there's the instruments panel. So if I want to add another instrument, I just select it and add it right in. And then from here, I can even drag and drop to change the order of my instruments on this particular uh, score. I can also change this. So if I don't want this to be a treble clef sound, I can go in and make it uh, bassoon, which of course change the clef, obviously affect the transposition of the instrument, but that's okay because we can simply go into transposition and just take this thing right on down an octave and we're good to go. Probably down another octave too in this case. But um, so that's the, the NoteFly editor. There, there are different views you can use. Some people like to use what we call strip view. Some people like to use flow view, which is a larger area. And these, these are obviously much more noticeable in um, larger scores, which I'll pull up some in a minute and we can see. And then you can easily zoom in and out with our slider, or there's always a quick zoom to fit feature right there. Um, you can also enter pitches by clicking on a particular keyboard. So you can use the keyboard um, and scroll up and down to use to enter notes here as well. Um, one of the key things about NoteFlight is the Connect panel. So the biggest benefit of being an online notation product is the way we can collaborate and the way we can share our music. There's no such thing as ever needing to um, download and save a file and email it to someone else or anyone having to have the latest version of anything. You simply share your scores by sharing with other users, or you can send users your unique score URL. So in this case, I can go and um, by default, the creator of every score owns it. But I can decide to share this with anyone with the link. At this point, I could actually email anyone this URL, and they could view my score in their browser. They don't even need a NoteFlight account to do that. Or I could share with other individuals in the NoteFlight community, and we could all collaborate together. So me and Joe could share, and I can give him editing privileges, and we could actually both work on this score at the same time. So anything on NoteFlight is shareable and customizable in that way. Now for school plans, we have something called NoteFlight Learn, which is um, what we're using as part of the uh, Ready21 adoption on what most schools use. What NoteFlight Learn does is give you a private community for all of teachers and students within a single school or a single district, but most people choose the school level. This means that we allow you to create your own unique URL that matches your school. So in this case, the name of my school is School Demo. And you'll have your school name .sites.noteflight. This puts everyone in a private domain, so you're no longer on noteflight.com. And this, of course, uh, allows teachers and students to interact freely within this environment without um, being on the regular web, which, of course, applies to all the uh, Child Online Privacy Protection Act and other rules like that, COPPA and FERPA and everything that were completely compliant. So once you set up your own site, the entire school will have its own URL where students and teachers will log in. At this point, you can create your own usernames simply by copy and pasting from a grade book or making up um, anything you would like. So right now, I'm looking at all of the students that exist in my school of school demo. If I'd like to add other students, I can add a student named CTO, and that's it. So then all CTO has to do is go to schooldemo.sites.noteflight and simply log in and create a password, and they'll be able to access my site. And I know you believe me, but just in case you don't, Seeing my new site, or you're seeing, you're still seeing the same page as before. I'm toggling Chrome windows, and I don't think you're seeing both of them. Um, I'm switch over. Oh, hi. Yeah, I was going to say I was just seeing the same page. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So I, you, you should be seeing it now, right? Mm -hmm. The login. Yeah. Okay. I'm. I need to toggle windows. That's fine. So I'm going to toggle a new window. And I'm going to just log in as CTL. And at this point, they don't, they don't have a password because students will be prompted to create their own. So at this point, they're going to create their own password. 
And the great thing is, is if they forget it, when they forget it, the teacher can just hit reset and they can pick a new one. It's very, very simple. So now I'm, I am student CTL and I'm logged into the site. So every student and teacher has their own unique login directly to this URL and it works really, really easily. Now, uh, moving on, what that allows us to do is, you know, we can add students and teachers. Teachers have different privileges. Of course, teachers can view any student's work. Teachers can basically do what I can do here is go to any member and I can click on them and I can view everything that particular member is working on, what scores they have, what they've been doing. So um, teachers have view access for other students. They can also log in as students as well. So you know, being a teacher gives you certain extra privileges. Um, in this case, I can go and just log in as and check out their account if I need to, or I can edit their information. Teachers can also create groups. So this is one of the really excited things about NoteFlight is that we inside NoteFlight Learn, because you're on this private site, you can create groups within your site. So a group can be any combination of people you would like. It could be an ensemble. In most cases, it's by ensembles. It's by the teacher's teaching schedule. It might be beginning band, choir. Uh, you can also do sections. So um, in this case, I have a clarinet section as a group. These students may exist in beginning band and intermediate band or in advanced band, but I also want all of my clarinets together in one group because I can share specific exercises or students within that clarinet group can collaborate with each other on clarinet specific stuff. And this can be any section of any you know, ensemble we have. A group can also be um, a curricular group. In this case, we'd have something called music theory where we would put um, the basic music theory exercises and scores for students, and this is where students would access all of that. So teachers can create groups and organize students, and then once a student's assigned a group, a student only sees the groups to which they're assigned. So it actually makes it very easy for a student to log in and go to their particular group, whether it's band or orchestra or music theory or class period two, whatever the group wants to be. And in there, they will find any assignments they may have. So every group has an overview. Um, every group has scores. So teachers or students can share scores with that group. And everyone who has access to this group can now see these different scores. Now, if you want to add members, a student can exist in as many groups as we need them to. So if I want to add students to this group, I'm looking at all of the student accounts I have in my site, and I can say I would like Kate and Kim and Liz. They're now going to take music theory, and I can hit OK, and I can add them. It's really that simple. There's also an option to just simply let students join the group themselves. So in this case, um, students can just find the group and decide if they want to join it on their own. So let's go to our friendly CTL student over here. CTL only belongs to the entire school right now, but they can look and see what other groups exist, and they can go find music theory, and because I've given them access, they can just click and join the group. And now they can see all of the scores. Um, well, they should be able to see the scores um, that are shared with that group. So let me go back here. I'm going to switch my group settings back so I don't forget to do it. So those different um, access levels as well. So I can actually make the group open so anyone can see what goes on. This can just be like an open discussion group. But in most cases, we're going to, as a teacher, assign students and only allow members to actually be part of it. So in this case, I'm going to make sure CTL is in here by adding them. Actually, they added themselves, so they're actually already in here. So as you can see, CTL is right here and a member of the group. So um, that's how groups work. Now, the cool thing about creating groups is now I can share music with a particular group or ensemble. So in this case, if I go and create a new score, and let's just make a quick little... Um, treble clef option. There's, there's different templates on here too we can always do, but let's say I want to create a little scale for my for my clarinets. So, so we made a quick little scale here. The only scale we ever need to know in the world. Um, and we might as well 
Might as well make it down quick. Cool. All right, so now I have a scale. Now if I want my particular subset of students to see this, all I have to do is actually share with a group. And I can say, okay, beginning band students, this is the scale we're now need to work on. And because I give it access to the group, any student beginning band can view the score. I can allow them to comment on it, or that I can allow them to even edit if we so choose. So that's another really great feature right here. Um, I can also let students export their own version. So they will see it as part of the group, but if they want to own this score as one copy, they can make a copy and save their own version, in which case they can actually edit it or change it or transpose it or do whatever they want with it because I'm allowing them to copy. And that can be turned on and off. The other feature that's really valuable for educators and students in, is called activity templates. And this is basically creating worksheets. So traditionally, with any sort of music theory or music composition or notation activity, you have to send the file to the student, and they have to open it and download it and save it and re-upload it and all of that. This eliminates all of that. So what we're doing is if I make a score an activity template, it, it sets this score up so any time a student or another user opens up my activity template, it automatically creates a custom copy. And I will show you what one of these looks like because I have a bunch in here. I'm going to get a dialogue that says you're about to leave and you haven't saved things, which is fine in this case, but it wants to make sure. So let's go into our composition exercise and I'll show you what this looks like. So I've created a basic exercise and I gave basically re finish out this melody. Um, in my panel, you'll see that I've shared this with multiple groups of students um, and I've also made it an activity template. Now what that means is you see that I have template copies up here. Every time a user opens this, it creates a copy. So let's actually go in as um, our brand new student we created, CTL, and they're actually going to go in and do this composition exercise. Now we actually have a new editor that will be defaulting on very soon, so I have to switch over. So now let me finish this out real quick. Give it a Beethoven Indian. Done. Um, so I've now completed this. I'm the student. I'm going to save this particular work. So now I'm going back to be Teacher John. And Teacher John will notice that another student has yet completed. Now I have four copies. So I'm the teacher. I can log on and look. CTL just, just opened this. That edit did not change my score but it allows me as the teacher to go through and actually open each one of these scores and say, let me look at what this student did. Cool. Now as a teacher, I can do, I can even give different comments too, which is cool. So I can op open up my little text panel here and I can do an annotation and say, this is so original. I would never be sarcastic to students, but it's fun on these webinars. So I can put a note here. I can open the side panel. And look, I've already given that, um, I've given Roger a few comments. We'll give Roger some more comments. So now when Roger opens the score, they will see my annotations, they will see my comments, and they'll be able to, to have that. So in this case, we can actually close up. That can also be a grade. I can give feedback. I can go and give the students a final grade and just let them know what their, what their score is. So we can open up CTL's version here that was just complete. And I might go in and say, not add a note to their score. That's probably not good. Uh, one thing I like to do, too, is open up my little color palette and give colors. And then I can even go over here and draw attention to that and say, blue notes, I love this line. Um, again, or if I want to give more detailed information on a single note, uh, these annotations work really well because I can go on and on and on and on just like that journey. Um, and that way it doesn't clutter up the, the notation, but the student can click and read what I wrote. 
or I can just write notes right in here, which is another way of giving feedback. So there's multiple ways to give students feedback in this particular situation. In this case, I would just go performance text and just write all sorts of stuff about this B. So I just wrote all sorts of stuff. As you can see, the annotations work out a little better for feedback because it doesn't actually clutter. I only like to use performance text when it actually affects the performance. But you can use whatever you want here. So I can do comments. I can color notes. I can save this. And the next time our student logs in, they will immediately be able to see all of my feedback, my colors, my annotations, my comments, right in here. So. This is a very easy way to, to teach music theory, to teach composition, to have students compose something and you can start them by giving them these composition prompts and at that point they can just complete and you will have an automatic copy of every student's work. In fact, I love doing composition exercises with all students where they write something for the whole class. As soon as I look at it and grade it, I'm now looking at this composition which the composer would be CTL because that's the name of the student who did this. At this point, I would actually, as the teacher, say, this is great. I want the entire beginning band to play this. And so I'm going to now share this score with the beginning band. So now they all have it. So I've done this for sight reading with, with, with students in a lot of cases, or sight singing, or any ensemble. Every student write an eight-measure exercise um, I give them an activity template to get started so it sets up the copies. And then I have them or I will share that score with the group. I usually want to grade it first before I share it with the whole class. But then all of a sudden you have 30 students. Everyone writes a sight singing exercise for the choir. Now you have 30 sight singing exercises that every student has access to. And the beautiful thing is because it's all music notation, if I want to just have them try it, maybe in a different mode or a different octave. Whatever I want to do, I can quickly adjust this um, and it's right there in notation. I can transpose it. I can add different elements to it. So it's all in there. Um, so that's activity templates and that's also sharing with the group and how we can collaborate on music in this particular account. Um, every score is saved. Uh, students can also, they can export their scores as Music XML and they can save them anywhere and they can use that Music XML as a common file format to open in any other notation program. At the same time, if the teacher is used to using another notation program, they can take any file from any other notation program, export it as Music XML and import that file into NoteFlight to be able to share and collaborate with all of their students. So you can bring in any existing notation files you have. At the same time, you can export and save a copy. You can, of course, print. You can see parts and all of that. So that's a great example of NoteFlight Learn. The other um, one I want to show you is that a, a brand new feature that's coming very, very soon. And this is a, really a first look at it. And I actually have to dig it out real quick to find what it is um, because there's a new there's a new version of it and it's here so this is brand new going into production literally right now um, but I'm going to show you since this is for the future what's going to be live later this week and what that is is this feature right here, which is called audio recording. So what we're doing is we're giving users the ability to audio record right into a score. You'll notice that these icons look slightly different than before. I want to zoom this just a little bit so I can see my score. And you'll notice we see audio segments. So I can turn these on and off if I do not want to see them or if I do. But now, very soon we're going to have record mode. And what this allows you to do is audio record yourself in your computer's built-in mic or with a USB mic, and it records your own playing. So in this case, you'll see that I have recorded myself playing, and actually another user, Jordy, has recorded themselves playing. So as a teacher, I can say, 
what does the note flight instrument sound like, what does John Malenzi's performance sound like, and what does Jordy's performance sound like. So I've actually recorded all of this together. Um, unfortunately, because of the, the way the web uh, go to webinar works, if I play this, it's going to play out of my computer speakers, so you're only going to really hear it from the mic picking up, and it's not going to sound that loud. We can, of course, try it, but I don't think it's going to be that audible. So you can hear, that's me playing trumpet right in there. And so I can maybe uh, scroll ahead to a section that has... So you can hear, that's me playing all three parts. And now I've, I've taken this Bach fugue and I've recorded myself playing all parts directly into Note Flight and I can hear this right here. So this recording feature is going to be really, really valuable for, all, for students and teachers because what it allows you to do is um, a number of things. I can first, as a teacher, I can play the section of music as a demonstration and then I can send this score to the student. They can see the music but they can hear me playing it and the student can play along and or record along while listening to me perform my part and they can actually play along with me while recording their own version. As a teacher, I can then go in and say, I want to listen, select who I want to listen to on the score. And I can even see the different waveforms based on how they performed it. It was Jordy played violin, I think, so it's a much different sound there. So this is actually really, really exciting. Um, this is great for student assessment, right? We can always assign playing test activities. We can assign um, different rep for students, and all of this is possible right within the NoteFlight account. What's really, really um, cool here is that you can actually, for the first time, create music in a browser and audio record yourself playing it at the same time. So all the other record along, play along apps sort of have preloaded content, where in NoteFlight Learn you can actually go in in the editor and you can compose music instantly. And then I can immediately go in and actually record this right away. So that's actually extremely valuable because I can now give exercises and activities to students that say I want you to compose an eight measure thing and then record yourself singing or playing it and then send it to another student and have them perform it and then compare the two performances and then maybe have, you know, so all of this is possible right within NoteFlight, which is really exciting. So recording is um, in production right now, as you can tell, and that will be out um, momentarily, and we'll cover that a lot in a lot more detail on the next webinar as well. Um, so the way we, we set up Note Flight and Learn, we have a few different options here, and I just wanted to point out on um, the Note Flight and Learn webpage um, on the Note Flight site, which is down on the left side, and you can go see the different purchase options, but Note Flight and Learn is, is right here. Anyone that's not using Note Flight Learn can, of course, request a demo right away or go straight to our feature page and, and view features. We have information on how Note Flight will work. Um, and then, of course, recording is coming this week, so we'll have an update to this page right away. Um, the other benefit of Note Flight Learn is that we can integrate with other learning management systems that use the basic LTI standards. So this means, for example, Canvas. We can integrate directly with Canvas, and that allows users to log into Canvas and then open NoteFlight from within Canvas to have sort of a single sign-on area. Um, the only downside of that right now is that Canvas doesn't, you know, use groups in the same way NoteFlight Learn uses groups. So we're giving teachers, as part of the Ready21 adoption, the choice on how they'd like to integrate this. We're recommending setting up an individual NoteFlight Learn site for your school so you can use groups to organize your students in any way. At the same time, if anything that you want to share in your learning management system, whether it's Google Classroom, whether it's Canvas, or whether it's emailing students an assignment, if you want to share a particular exercise or activity, all you have to do is actually give students the URL of the score. So send them this link as a hyperlink. As soon as students click on it, um, if they're not already logged in NoteFlight, they'll have to log in, but then they'll, you can send them directly to it. So 
a lot of people in Google Classroom, you have that option of insert a link into this assignment, and the easiest thing to do is just to add this note flight hyperlink right in, and that's the way you'd share your activity templates or your scores that you would like students to work on. Um, the activity template feature in NoteFlight is really, really good for organizing. So even if it's a, a free composition assignment for students, I always give them a title um, and just a prompt so I can have them all open the assignment from my activity template. Therefore, I don't have to hunt down their work or they don't have to remember to submit it to me ever. I can just see that the students have created activity templates based on the list that I have right on there. So um, that's another really valuable, beneficial part. So sort of a recap, we've talked about the note flight editor. We've talked about how everything is in the left-hand side as palettes that you can access, and you can actually leave this bar open. A lot of people like to do that and just look at their score in this way and have access over here. You can also pin commonly used features to your top palette if you'd like to do that. You can, of course, take them all away if you choose and just use the drop down on the left. It's completely customizable. It totally depends on how you like to compose and how your students like to compose. So I usually like having at least these up here. Maybe not Notehead. Um, that's sort of my go-to in tempo as well. Um, but that's the editor. Again, the user guide is always accessible from the left and the user guide follows the same order as all of the palettes, so it's easy to identify where to, where to go when you need help. Adding and changing instruments is really easy with drag and drop, as well as editing instrument sounds and transpositions, and you can actually turn instruments off. So I didn't delete that score, I just simply hit it, and I can always bring it back at a later date if I want to. So you have that option as well. We talked about using NoteFlight Learn and how it takes all of those features and allows students to all join into a private school URL site. And then you can create any combination of students using groups later. And you can create these different groups for class, ensemble, section, um, composition assignments, music theory, whatever you want to group. So a group can be exist to organize students, it can exist to organize scores. You can create groups of all the jazz scores, of all the rock scores, and it's just a group that exists to organize all of the scores you want to share with that group, and you can have students join in and out of your group um, easily to stay organized. We talked about using activity templates, which makes it really easy for student copies to show up and to organize all student work. So in this case, um, I can go, I'm pretty sure I've shared my composition exercise with beginning band, and lo and behold, there's my activity template, and I can see every copy a student's worked on. So the idea of creating an exercise, sharing it with a group as an activity template is an immediate workflow that makes everything really quick as far as getting student feedback and getting students to work on composition or theory assignments. At um, that point, you know, we can do integrations with uh, Canvas. Um, most people really like to use the score URL to direct students to where, they're, where they need to go, and this can be in any manager system you want. You can just pop a URL in any assignment feature you would like. Um, so from there, that's sort of the full overview of NoteFlight as a notation editor, as well as NoteFlight Learn, which is part of the Ready21 adoption uh, with creating your own site for your school. Um, at this point, I'm happy to open up the floor to any questions we may have. And of course, um, you're very much welcome to uh, you know, follow up with CTL or myself. I'm happy to give my email at the end of this as well. Oh, great. Hi, John. This is Stephanie Shea. I'm marketing manager here at CTL, and I actually am also a musician in my other life, so I, <laughs> I'm a fan of NoteFlight. Um, and I've been, yeah, really enjoying your presentation so far. I'm going to read the questions that we have, and then I actually have a couple questions for you as well. Perfect. Um, yeah, the first thing, though, someone's asking about the transcribe function, and they wanted to see if you could show a little bit about how that works. Sure. So transcribe is actually MIDI transcribe. So I don't have a MIDI controller hooked up, so it's not going to let me use it. But what transcribe does is... Um, uh, 
allows you to use any USB MIDI controller and you can, uh, instead of entering notes by clicking or playing them or entering notes by typing in the note name on the keyboard, you can actually play in on a MIDI controller the name of the note. And there's two ways to do that. I can just press the note and it shows up and I can affect the duration of the note after I enter it, or I can play with a metronome and have NoteFlate transcribe what I play in on that MIDI controller. And it works with any standard um, MIDI controller out there. You just have to have it plugged in or the feature won't won't let you do it. So sorry I'm not prepared mm -hmm. with a MIDI controller to show that. That's that's okay. So that kind of makes me wonder when the record function comes out, would um, you know, non MIDI instruments like a trumpet or something be able to also have their stuff transcribed playing into the recording? You know, I've I've we've heard this request and every every notation product gets this request <laughs> and my, my short answer is if there was an easy way to do it technically it would have been done a thousand times right now mm -hmm. there there's a reason why no notation product can do this right now in, in one step because it's very very hard and it's very hard to do it accurately because live players um, you know and transfers audio to MIDI is is a process that has to happen after the fact so um, we wish it was a lot easier to build, but there, there's a reason why nobody's doing it right now. Mm -hmm. It is very doable. I used to do it in a nut, but you have to take in one program, then you have to take your audio, then you have to convert it to MIDI, then you have to quantize it, then you have to re-upload it. So it's doable in multiple processes, but not instantaneous right now. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. good to know. Um, but, you know, if, it, if something changes, it makes it a lot easier to do. We would certainly look into it. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I had a question actually about the layout functionality, a couple things. Um, is When I've used NoteFlight, there was like a box that you could pop out and click on, for example, quarter note or eighth note. And I yeah, find so that easier the than that when you're showing on the side. I'm wondering if you can show that pop out box. So that actually, that's that was the original NoteFlight editor, and that was built on Flash technology. Okay. Uh, Adobe has, you know, basically said they're going to stop pro um, supporting Flash, and so we are actually moving off of that editor. So this this is the new improved HTML5 editor that you're seeing that actually works on all um, all devices. Because again, a Flash wouldn't work on iPad for a lot of reasons too. So uh. that's another reason. Flash. So, in this case, you know, um, for for every user that says they liked the floating box, mm -hmm. we have another one that says they hated it because they have to keep moving it around and it gets in the way and blah blah blah. And they want things pinned to the top. So, um, most people find that having these customized palettes that always exist up here are easier. But um, we may bring back another floating box version if enough people feel they want it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can get used to the top. Um palette, but I just enjoyed having it in a box. <laughs> um, so I thought if that was still there, other people might be interested. Um, but the other thing has to do with layout and adding chords above a melody. I've found the spacing to be challenging. I'm figuring there must be a trick so that even if your notes kind of go above the staff that it doesn't bump into the chords. So, okay, so that's building, but like when you do, you know, write C7, like you're putting your chord call in there. Oh, 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 oh gotcha. mm -hmm. Like for a jazz chart. Sure. So, in this case, um, you're talking about using the, the, the chord tool. Yes. Tool. And I, I found that tool, but then when I did it across numerous lines, when there was already a melody, I was having trouble getting the spacing correctly. The spacing of the actual chord symbols or the spacing of? the Yes, the chord symbols along with the line so that it, um, you know, wasn't bumping into it. Huh, interesting. And you were using the... Um... This was in the in the flash editor, I presume. Yes. So chord symbol, there we go. See, look at. I think you've solved it in this version because that looks much more uh, manageable in the box. Oh yeah. Okay. 
So yeah, when so it gets it should, too high. So it should format itself up, yeah. Ah, how did you just move everything down like that? So in this case, it's the, the arrow keys. So I can position the chord symbol by pushing the arrow up and down. Ah, or, even, or even left and right. I never knew how to do this. Okay. <laughs> Yep, so I'm left arrow, up arrow, right arrow, down arrow. Oh, that's really valuable. Okay, so this may also go along with lyrics, like if you're putting those under, it's the yeah. same kind of premise. Yes, exactly. So, but this actually affects the, you know, the, and you can actually adjust, but most people want their chord symbols in a line. Recently, too, we've made the update that, you know, most people want all their chord symbols in the same plane. Mm -hmm. We actually have changed it to give you the option to switch this up. Um, the other interesting thing I should mention about chord symbols while we're talking about this particular one, and I'll, I'll talk about the, uh, uh, the lyric tool, is that chord symbols also do figured bass. So if I want to do a... Um, sort of figured bass, it automatically defaults. So for a lot of colleges and then that use figured bass as a thing, you can use chord symbols and basically type in um, the standard figured bass things and it will actually give you, it will format it for you correctly. And in this case, what a lot of people choose to do is actually put it below the node. Mm -hmm. But we do have chord symbols that, that work for figured bass. Very cool. And so you can use um, for example. So um, as far as lyrics are concerned, you can go back into text. Yeah, so we now have two levels of lyrics and they actually will auto space out to not get in the way of stuff as well. If that's what you're asking. Yes, that's great. Um, yeah, this I think this would be really helpful to choir teachers and yeah, it was just, I was, I think you fixed it in this version. I was having trouble getting it um, space. Well, a lot of things, I mean, the, the reason we moved off the flash editors, you know, there, there are a lot of things that were limited by the flash editor and things we could do. And, you know, you get to a point after, you know, NoFlight was built in 2008 and once we got, you know, to 2014, six years later, there's a lot of lessons learned and there's a lot of um, things that we wish we could build, but it also requires us to redo everything. So the HTML5 editor is essentially that. We've redone everything. Mm -hmm. So it allows us to rebuild, you know, it's so funny when people look at software and say, I wish this feature did this, and sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's like, that's six months of work. Mm -hmm. You know, like to re, it wasn't, designed. so it depends on, and so the, the HTML5 editor allowed us to completely rebuild everything, not only for the features we want, but we've built it in such a way that adding features, adding into here, plugging in new things, even, even stuff that we may not be thinking of at all right now is going to be very, very, very easy. Um, in how we've set up the infrastructure on the back end to add and remove elements. So we're able to make updates to this particular editor very quickly now. Oh, that's great. Um, we, okay, we do have another question um, regarding playback and wanting to see how to play back what's been written. Yeah, I mean, so basically we have, we, we function in two different modes, which is sort of play and Perf um, edit mode. So right now I'm in the editor where I'm actually editing notes. As soon as I basically, if from any measure, I can hit the space bar and play back, right? Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Getting pinged during the webinar. Um, um, so you'll notice that space bar takes me into what we call playback mode. And you can go back to the beginning. You can also click any measure in real time and have it jump to it. There is a mixer where you can actually, um, we only have one instrument here so it doesn't really look, but every, every staff is, is mixable so you can edit the volume of each line as well. And then once recording is live, as you saw, you'll be able to select, do I want to hear a note flight instrument or do I want to record myself playing it and listen to that. Mm, okay. So then play, that's playback mode. We can always go out of playback mode and then edit mode, which means as I click around, I'm actually editing the notation. And then playback mode takes me into play so I can select measures for cursor positioning. Okay. 
Great. And then um, let's see what else we have about um, sharing charts. Like if a chart is public, I think someone just wants to clarify, you know, how if people they don't know are able to access their chart and, and how you can just go over sure. how you can do that. Um, well, yes. So actually, now in NoFlight Learn, everything's contained to the school URL. So um, anything that's shared with the entire site is actually only shared to that URL. So it's not on NoFlight.com, and it's not you know public per se. Um, and I'll show that here. So all site members mean anyone that has access to schooldemo.sites.noteflight. So on noteflight.com, it works similarly, except that it shares with, you know, a user can choose to share with all of Noteflight. Now, by default, all scores are owned by the user who created them, and they're not shared. You have to, unlike other programs that, like, only let you do public scores or something like that, which is weird, um, everything is your own. If you want to share it with everyone, you have to actively click all site members. At this case, even if I say all site members here, the only person who could see this score, I'd have to email this URL to someone with access for them to know it exists. They, it doesn't show up in a search. I would then have to click anyone can search or browse to find it to allow it to show up publicly. So everything's private. A user can choose to give anyone access. This would be like share in a Google Doc, like I'm going to hit everyone has access and I'm going to send you this link to open up. Or as a second step, a user will click allow anyone to search and browse to find it. Then it shows up as a public score. So it, it's everything shareable, but the user has to take action to make that happen. It doesn't automatically do it. Okay, yeah, I think that was probably the concern is if people are seeing it. But I could see how this could be really useful because if you were sharing with another teacher like in your district but they weren't in your school group, then you could use this method, right? Well, so, and, and that's a really good point. In districts, every school learn site is a specific URL and it's, it's completely self-contained. So if I, if you were on elementary school a.sites.noteflight and I was on middle school C that's a note flight, we would not be able to share URLs because we don't have access. So there's two things we could do. We could give each other access to our sites, like create usernames for each other so we could log in. Or the easiest thing to do if I have something I want to share with a teacher is I'm just going to export it and I'm going to save it as a note flight score and I'll just email it to the other teacher and they can import it into their site as a note flight score and it comes in everything you see here. Oh, so that's you would export cool. it from one site. Yeah, so the sites by law have to be completely self-contained. That's the Child Online Privacy Protection Act. So it's not public. It doesn't, it's not talking to anything on noteflight.com. There's no one else can access any of the students or any of their scores or anything. Okay. That's, yeah, that's really important. And then it looks like you can print directly also if you want to print directly yep. out of NoteFlight. Yep, you can print, print all the parts, absolutely. Okay, or PDF, I saw that on there. I, I've used that one before. Um, print or we can create a PDF, exactly. You can export to a PDF or print it, however you want to do it. Okay, um, I haven't seen anything else come in. I think as far as what I was curious about, this has been really useful. I can see how it would be really excellent, you know, testing tool because with those activities and it looks, you know, like the students can't, you can set it up where they can't see each other's for the certain ones you're kind of testing them, right? Yeah, so activity templates, as soon as a student opens it, it's a private copy between teacher and student. No one else can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great. Um, yeah, this is, you know, I've, I've found this to be pretty intuitive, especially compared to something, you know, uh, what's the one, the main one a lot of other composers are using. Finale, finale yeah, I found Finale kind of overwhelming, and this, I could see how a kid in any grade almost could just start typing letters <laughs> and getting their notes, you know. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Um, well, great, John. I don't want to uh, run our time over the clock here, so I'm going to, 
pass this back over to Amy to do our wrap up. That uh, thank you so much for answering these questions. Of course. All right, that was really informative. Thank you, Stephanie, and our attendees for those great questions. Thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, an introduction to NoteFlight. I can't wait for part two and part three. Um, if you have any other questions, please contact me at the email you see on the screen once you leave today's webinar. And you see John's email up there on the screen as well. You will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete it and follow, uh, complete and provide your feedback. Please don't forget to visit our nr21.ctl.net website for news and information for Nevada 21 program. And uh, the survey is important because it goes back to this whole event with our, um, for the State Department as well and for uh, the NR21 program. So we would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, we'd also want to invite you for upcoming webinars in May. You'll see the link there. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with the link to view the recording of today's webinar. And on behalf of CTO and our presenters, we thank you for joining us today and have a great day. Bye.